So now they will be a lot of slides with a lot of formulas, but I will run through them very fast. The only thing actually which this paper has to do with philosophy that it was also published in Foundations of Physics. Could you imagine? Now, uh, okay, what is the history of this book? I was in Princeton, spending half a year sabbatical. It was extremely boring. Because there is absolutely nothing to do there. Okay, my apartment, which had, was huge, because my family refused to join me. And uh, I was in advanced study institute, where, as you understand, nobody normally is in the corridors, and everybody behaves like he's what. But it's okay. Now, after that, I moved to Jadwin Hall. But then I decided to derive analytically the curves which people normally obtain on computers using so-called CMB fast code, which was invented at this time by Urash Seljak and Zaldariaga. In fact, actually, the idea was very easy because when people were writing computer programs, they were calculating the whole sky at each moment of time and then proceeding from recombination to the present. But they suggested a very simple thing. Integrate a long right, uh, light ray all the time without building the whole picture. And then it reduced five hours programs, which were running for one set of the parameter, to three minutes. You see, so it was big invention. Then, at about the same time, uh, Steve Weinberg was writing papers, trying to derive the things analytically. But he missed something, which I, at the beginning, also was missing, and you will see what is the power of general relativity, by the way. In this case, because I will stress these all points. Now, it was supposed to be for the book as a chapter, but then, okay, I took two chapters of the book, nuclear synthesis without computer, and this thing, and published it as a separate papers. It's rather messy calculations, but these calculations is about well-known physics. Eric is not here. He nearly convinced me today that the universe is not expanding and cosmological constant doesn't exist. So I said, should I give my talk or not? But then I recall that yesterday he was sick. Therefore, I decided that I will continue because perhaps yesterday he went to too philosophical mood. Yeah, so now, then the problem was how what is the title of the paper? But this title belongs not to me because there was computer code which was called CMB fast. And then, okay, Vinitsky, who was postdoc with me at this time, suggested me this title, CMB slow. Because I really spent three months like mad trying to find out how to fix the problem. As you will see, which we could not reproduce the results. Then I called Steve Weinberg and asked him how you managed to do it. He told me, no, no, I didn't manage. But student wanted to please me. Therefore, he was calculating with computer curve for the other set of parameters and comparing it with my theoretical curve with parameters which have nothing to do with this set of parameters. And you will see why, and you will see actually where is the physics there. Because yesterday, what I told you, the beginning of the universe was very, very simple. As a result of exponential expansion, we produced embryons for the forming of galaxies, right? And they have most democratic properties. First of all, they are Gaussian. Everybody is equal to everybody. Not like in oral book, right? Then, second thing. Uh, spectra is extremely simple. It's just flat spectra with logarithmic dependence. Then, perturbations are adiabatic. 
correct? And the universe is flat. The simplest model, then you don't need to make headache. And then what people observe, they observe very complicated thing. And the things which were calculated were referring to the moment of time like 10 minus 35 seconds. And they were within causally connected region when you were producing them. And what is the definition of causally connected region? Okay? It's like this one. Horizon scale is scale factor at the given moment of time, then integral dt divided by scale factor. Now, you see, what does it mean causally connected region? If you don't have accelerated expansion, what does it mean accelerated expansion? Take A proportion to T in power alpha. When second derivative of this thing is negative for which alpha? For alpha larger than one. Second derivative is no, second derivative is positive for alpha larger than one. Then you have accelerated expansion, right? And the normal decelerated expansion is A, for instance, proportional to T in power two third for dust, A proportional to T in power one half for radiation. Second derivative here is negative. Gravity is acting like attractive force. Now, this is the size of causally connected region. But if A is T in power two third, where the main contribution to this integral comes? From the upper end, right? And therefore, you can cancel A here, and you will get the size of causally connected region, speed of light multiplied by time. Correct? But if you have exponential expansion, here you write exponent ht, and here you write exponent ht. How this size of causally connected region is growing? Integral is convergent in this case, when you integrate by t. So the size of causally connected region in accelerated universe goes proportional to the scale factor. This is the reason why some people speak about superluminal expansion. Of course, light is always propagating with the speed of light. But this is more or less the similar story to the black hole when time or oh, space is squeezing faster than the light is propagating. If I will take horizon of the black hole, this is the other example, right? If I will be sending photon outside, then this photon will go with the speed of light outside, but nevertheless, the space will be bringing it back. So it will be standing on horizon if it's directed in this direction. This is the reason why people call horizons in the black hole time-like surfaces. The sitter is like black hole okay, reverse. Because the sitter also has horizon, but a distinction from uh, black hole, okay, it's like white hole. If you are here on the horizon, it depends also on the observer. And when you send light here in the direction of observer, then the space is expanding so fast that it keeps this photon here. Or the whole thing goes away. You see if it's in opposite direction. So, on this stage of accelerated expansion, you understand I produce exponentially large causally connected regions, and I formed embryons of all kinds of sizes thanks to this exponential expansion. But then, dark energy decayed, right? And the universe becomes normal universe, which is dominated by, for instance, dust or radiation or whatsoever. And the size of causally connected region, starting from this moment of time, will be just proportional to the time. And at the beginning, immediately after decay of inflation, 
the size of causally connected region is negligible compared to the scale which we are considering. And therefore, it protects us from all after inflationary physics because you understand that you produced seed or embryon for the galaxies, but they are causally disconnected after decay of the earlier dark energy, and they do not care what happens on the way because it can influence only this piece or this piece or this piece of the embryo, but in total it stays the same. So causality protects us from the influence of particle physics, which we do not know at this moment of time. Okay, you could think about this embryo for the galaxies, which you put in the freezer and left there, okay, for 300,000 years. Because when the time becomes around 100,000 years, okay, this kind of things comes within causally connected region. Embryon wakes up and starts to evolve with the baby for the galaxies. And we can observe this baby using CMB. It's like ultrasound, yeah, in this particular case. And how this guy starts to develop, of course, depends on the surrounding. You know it with kids. You see, everything depends on the surrounding. And we have to calculate the influence of the surrounding on these seeds at the moment of time, at the moment of time when it's, of course, huge compared to 10 minus 35 seconds, but it's still early universe, it's still 100,000 years. You see, and therefore, okay, let me go through the set of formulas. At the beginning, universe is characterized after inflation in a very simple way. So it's so-called Friedman flat universe I take here. It's expand proportional to this factor. And this is normal Newtonian gravitational potential. <coughs> there is also some piece, transverse traceless part of the metric tensor, which corresponds to the gravity waves, you see? And we have prediction for this thing immediately after inflation, and nothing happens with this prediction for a very long time before the whole thing starts to evolve. Or imagine that you have, for instance, pendulum, yeah? But he can see the pendulum at the times much, much shorter than the period of oscillation. And then what you see, this pendulum is not moving at all. The same thing happens with this inhomogeneity. They should become sound waves, but because the frequency of these sound waves is about 300,000 years or 100,000 years, you see like they are frozen. You see nothing happens with them. They survive till last moment, till the late, mo late moment of time, practically untouched irrespective of all these complicated particle physics because we are interested in physics in much larger scales and it's only about gravity, not about matter content or okay, smaller scale. And then we have predictions for these two things, namely the prediction for the spectra, as I said, is characterized what is called spectral index for which the value should be smaller than 0 0.97, because 0 0.96, you are getting like uh, one minus some number divided by logarithm of the ratio of galactic scale, megaparsec, to the CMB scale. As I told you before, and I repeat it once more, this is the only formula besides of Hawking radiation, which simultaneously involves Planck constant and gravitational constant. Because it's clear, because you quantize the things in gravity, both things should come together there. Then, 
Let's consider surrounding where this kid starts to develop after it enter, it woke up. So, content of the matter, it can be contribute to the matter. Radiation, neutrino, baryons, cold dark matter, and cold dark energy. You see, I was confused for a very long time. What does it mean called dark, uh, what does it mean dark matter and dark energy? You understand that in general relativity, everything what is in the right hand side of Einstein equation, people call matter. Then I asked Steinhardt who invented this dark energy. What is this bloody dark energy? Because it's also matter according to Marxism, Leninism, and according to general relativity. He told me, oh, it's not the same philosophical tradition. In America, we have different philosophical traditions. I told him, Paul, I am surprised that in America you have even philosophy, yeah? <laughs> but the guy studied in the Latin school, and this is the origin why they appeared called. No, dark energy, which is different from dark matter, because when you call cold dark matter, you mean that pressure is equal to zero from general relativity. And dark energy, pressure is equal minus energy density. And radiation is, I don't know how to call it, energy or matter. have no idea. Yeah, but it's relativistic. It also is contribute to see. It's surrounded. Then you can define what is called critical energy density. It's the energy density which characterizes the kinetic or kinetic energy of the Hubble expansion with the appropriate thing. Then inflation never predicts this composition. Okay, forget about this composition. You can write here. 300 more components. Inflation never predicts the whole thing. But what inflation predicts? That if you will take all components and then divide, okay, this total energy of the matter to this critical energy density, which is kinetic energy, then this number should be precisely equal one. And this number determines you the geometry at present. You see, which you see, you can measure. Of course, one of the ways to measure this omega is to wait to find all these components, to sum them up, and then divide by critical energy density, which is determined by the Hubble constant. And people were doing like this one. Yeah, why? Because they were looking in the 80s, I remember, could not count more than 3% contribution to this one. Then Peebles was doing this uh, non-equilibrium virial theorem, studying the clusters of the galaxies. But he could hardly can get more than 0.2. You see, then this 0.2 when astronomical observations improved in 93, okay, when people started to use this Keck telescope, etc., uh, they could get 0 0.7, but 0. Point, no, 0 0.3, but it was never more than 0 0.3 in any astronomical observations, but this is the reason why there came dark energy, the balance of energies, became precisely one. And you could measure this thing not waiting the whole thing. The other way, as you understand, you can have some kind of standard ruler. And under which angle you see this standard ruler depends on the geometry of the universe. And we have only one good standard ruler, perfect standard ruler in the universe, which is the size of the horizon at the moment of recombination. And if universe is really flat, you have to see 
this standard ruler today at the angle like 0 0.87 degrees. If universe would be Minkowski space, then, okay, the size of the horizon at the moment of recombination is 10, 20, 3 centimeter, yeah, 10 power 23 centimeter, you would see this size as a scale which would be 1,000 times smaller, or maybe 30 times smaller. I forgot already the dependence. But because universe is curved in four-dimensional space, when you say flat universe, you should never confuse flat universe at the given moment of time with curved universe in four-dimensional sense, because in the four-dimensional curvature also contributes time derivatives. And by the way, this kind of confusion, even between physicists, sometimes will produce a problem, because when the whole thing appeared, okay, then people were considering that universe um, is reheated via formation of the bubbles, and Hawking was in Moscow, where he confirmed that, okay, you cannot produce taking the scalar field potential like this one. Like this one, yeah, okay. And tunneling, you can never produce the bubbles which would collide because they are separated exponentially faster than they are expanding. They are expanding just with the speed of light. Therefore, Hawking was claiming that, okay, this inflationary scenario is dead because as a result of this evolution, we form flat universe. And Linda, who at this time changed potential and makes smooth transition like this one, was saying, no, now we have everything, yeah? Universe is flat, is prediction. Then one guy says, yes, universe is flat, keeping in mind Minkowski space. Linde say universe is flat, keeping in mind that the geometry at the given moment of time flat. And it required from them the whole week of interaction, with Hawking was not easy to interact, yeah, to find out that they speak about two different things, okay? Flat in a sense of four-dimensional space and flat in a sense slice of four-dimensional space. But it's okay. So these are predictions. Now, what are the guy who influence the evolution after that and unknown parameter which we are supposing to determine because the kids started to develop and they, how they develop depends on the surrounding. And what is surrounding, in particular, which influence the development of these kids who, are who become galaxies, is the Hubble constant, which I normalized here on 75 kilometers per second per megaparsec. It was, by the way, one of the most interesting historical development of this thing, because Hubble, at the beginning, when he made measurement, because how you normally make measurement of the Hubble constant? You take galaxy, okay, so as I told you, this is the Hubble law, yeah? Then, this velocity you could determine very easily just measuring the Doppler shift of the spectral line, right? Distance between the, standard, between the galaxies, how could you measure? to the nearby galaxy, independent on anything. How could you measure it? You have to use what is called standard candles. Some kind of object or stars about which you assume that they have the same luminosity. You can identify them, you know the absolute luminosity, and then actually just knowing absolute luminosity, 
and now in a parent university, brightness on photo plates today, you can find the distance. But of course, there was always headache with these bloody standard candles, because as a standard candles, people were using cepheids. And right now also, all this tension, H0 tension, etc., etc., they just appeared because Cepheids also is not so good standard candles for precision cosmology. Therefore, it's just a joke when people claim that on the basis of this supernova observation, you are getting in contradiction with the result of CMB. Okay, you have to tell these people, okay, learn at least your own subject. Not all of them are like this one, because actually, for instance, Wendy Friedman, who is biggest specialist in this field, told me, okay, let's forget about using sigma in cosmology because when systematic is not under control, it can be anything. So I recall 95, when there was big contradiction between the age of the universe and the age of global or clusters. Global or cluster, it was claimed they are 16 billion years old. And the age of the universe at this time was 12 billion years old. And then the guy who was doing this global cluster from Canada, I asked him, but what does it mean 16 plus minus 2? He said, oh, God knows, I do not know myself about this plus minus 2. But it's clear that we know this number with accuracy not better than plus minus 2. And how worse we know it? Nobody knows because it's systematics, what I told you. You see, in CFEs also there is a lot of systematics right now because they are used to calibrate supernova. Even supernova 1A happened to be not precisely the same standard candles, but at least this problem was resolved right now. They were classified in four different groups, and you could determine to which group it belongs. Uh, I'm not talking to okay, astrophysics, therefore I have perhaps to speed up. Yeah. Then within this each subgroup, supernova more or less standard candle. But of course, Hubble made mistake here, and for Hubble constant, he got the number 500 kilometers of a second of a megaparsec, because there was no good standard candles. And when you would take divide by Hubble constant, you are getting that the age of the universe is smaller than the age of the Earth. And in fact, determination of this Hubble constant was a big headache for a very long time, because there was two groups. Vacular and Sandwich and Taman. One group was given, Vacular, 100 kilometers of a second of a megaparsec, and the other group, Sandwich and Taman, was given 50 kilometers of a second, uh, or kilometers of a second of a megaparsec. Okay, series, because they didn't know whom to trust, they were taking 75. Now it's 68, so... The guys who was more close to reality were theorists. But you understand that this factor too was big headache. Therefore, people, when they were writing formulas, they were always writing, normalizing some Hubble constant on some number and then studying the dependence on this parameter. So, as I told, the other parameter on which embryon development depends is total density, energy density of cold matter. It's cold dark matter plus energy density of baryons themselves. You see? Why? Because this thing, after radiation become negligible, determine your gravitational potential. Also, the features of these seeds, galactic seeds, depends separately from baryon density. Why? Because you understand that before recombination, you had the particles of cold dark matter. They were not interacting electromagnetically with the rest, and they were developing as they want. They started to infer gravitational stability before. But, for instance, baryons, 
and radiation was tightly coupled because uh, hydrogen was ionized, then photons were not able to travel too far away, okay, before scatterings, and therefore it was relativistic baryon radiation plasma. And of course, the speed of sound in this plasma depends on the amount of baryons there, because if baryons or electrons would be, for instance, baryons massless, then the speed of sound in this plasma would be like speed of light divided by square root of three. But more heavy sound wave, less is the speed of the propagation. This is the reason why baryon enter substantially in the features of the spectra which will be formed. Then cosmological constant also will influence the features. Why? Because cosmological constant, or better to say current dark energy, the philosophy of which you are discussing here, it determines you the contribution to the geometry of the universe. You see when it makes it flat, okay, you see this standard ruler, which is horizon at the moment of recombination, at the angle 0 0.87 degrees, of which multiple this one degree corresponds. You know what is multiple? It's when you explain the things in terms of spherical harmonics, and when you want to characterize some angle like this one, it's one divided by angle, multiples, no, two pi or pi divided by angle. Then one degree is, of course, multiple, 180 degrees divided by one degree, so it's multiple, as we will see, correspond 200. You see? So this is the feature which corresponds to the standard candle, standard ruler. Now, what are the other things? Of course, how fast embryon will grow depends on the initial amplitude of this spectra. But this is parameter of the theory, okay, which you have to fit to to, see, to select to fit the observations. There is no prediction for it, besides the speculation. Then spectral index is predicted, and it also determines you how the things finally will be formed. Then if omega total is equal to one, then omega lambda, there is this kind of bias, but first you have to be sure that omega total is equal one. And when I will be making calculation, I will make this bias because I'm not crazy to do it in the presence of special curvature because you will see that there is a lot of mess even before that. When you fall asleep, finally, you tell me, right, then I don't need to waste so much efforts. Yes, please. Yes, the energy density of neutrinos is also important, and I think it's written in the next slide, where there is extra parameter influencing the spectrum, okay, in particular... Wait a minute. No, okay, there should be. The amount of neutrinos, also helium recombination, because it happens a little bit before, but nevertheless, it still leaves a lot of free electrons, and therefore, when helium recombines, Universe is still non-transparent. And neutrinos, of course, determine you the rate of the expansion because, okay, if it was relativistic component, then the rate of expansion is too high. 
And if you use computer programs, you could even put up a limit on the number of neutrinos from this same B-data. You see? But, of course, it's more tricky things which I cannot trace, okay, my analytical methods. My analytical methods are enough to understand just the major dependence on the parameters. Because when Weinberg has sent this paper, his paper to FISREF, D, then he got negative referee report, not negative, positive referee report, but referee was just complete idiot. We don't know who is he, therefore it's politically correct to call him idiot. Because he asked, but can you compete with numerical codes? And then Steve was actually, Steven was furious. He thought, who are they sitting? Okay, these people understand nothing. Our purpose is not to compute with computers, you see. Our purpose is understanding of the features. So, in such a way that next time you will not doubt the expansion of the universe, at least. Now, if you are in normal shape. Okay, good. Eric is not here, therefore he is not complaining. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now, how you characterize normally the past history of the universe? By parameter which is called redshift. Redshift today is zero. When the universe was 100 times smaller, this doesn't mean that the universe really was 100 times smaller because universe can be infinite by all distances between two meta elements were 100 times smaller, right? Then it corresponds to the redshift 99 because, okay, the ratio of the size of this scale factor, which characterizes how universe is stretched, is one plus z. And then let's go to the past. What was the important moment for the forming of the final spectra beginning with the simplest possible spectra Everything happens at the time between 100,000 years and 300,000 years. And here is energy density, you see. Dark energy, which could be cosmological constant, quintessence, k-essence, we do not know what is this. The main thing is that it imitates the equation of state, pressure is equal minus energy density, and this we need. It's relevant today. Today it's 70% or more than 70%. But you understand that it stays constant. It's not changing. And if you would draw how energy density of cold matter is changing, how it's changing, inversely proportional to the volume, right? So volume is proportional to so-called scale factor cube. Therefore, and one of the scale factor is z. Therefore, the energy density of the matter when you go in past is growing like cube. At redshift of the order of unity, you know that you can forget about contribution of the cold matter in the total density of the universe. If you take radiation, then radiation is redshifted also. And each photon is redshifted. Its frequency drops inversely proportional to the size of the universe. But the number of photons is conserved. This is the reason why, okay, in spite of the fact that today energy density of radiation is negligible, when you go in past, then at some moment of time, when the universe was about 5,000 times smaller than it is today, the energy density of radiation was dominant, concerning contribution to the gravitational field. You see, and this moment is called equality moment. It plays important role in the forming features of our kids called galaxies, or spectra from which these galaxies are coming. Or better to say, kids who are not yet, who just started to develop. 
And then the features which we are getting, we are getting using this primordial radiation, which stop to scatter on the matter at the moment of time when temperature was about 2,700 degrees. And within this interval, which corresponds to the time between 390,000 years and 300,000 years, okay, the photon decouple and go. For instance, last scattering could happen here, could happen here, could happen here, within this layer. And it's quite important that it's not instantaneous process. The fact that the photons, okay, for instance, could last time scattered here or scattered here, is important for forming of so-called polarization of this background radiation, as you will see. So the whole process, when the universe becomes transparent, takes a quarter of cosmological time, as I told you, about 90,000 years. Then, here the universe is transparent, and we are getting the picture. So now you see the guy, okay, some good astronomer, who observe standard ruler. Standard ruler, for instance, imagine that it's galaxy of a certain side. Or this standard ruler, which is 10 multiplied by 30. 23, 10 multiplied by 23 centimeters. It's the order of the galaxy. But this is the size of the horizon. When you start to move it further, at which angle you will see it? At small angle at the beginning. For red shift, smaller than one. You see? But if you would move it even more further, then, for the same start, size, it starts to grow. How is it possible? Who, who can explain me? Simple example. Look, philosophers should know at least this simple example. How to understand why you are moving object more far away and its size becomes larger. Huh? Maybe it's getting larger, actually. No, 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 no. Very simple example. Very simple example using just sphere. Okay, you know that on the sphere, what are geodesics and uh, what are geodesics? Meridians, right? And parallels are not geodesics, right? Therefore, the light should propagate along geodesics. Now, imagine that you are an observer who is sitting here on the North Pole. And then, okay, you take, for instance, one meter ruler and start to move it. Okay, then you see it under this angle. Then you move it further, then you see it as a smaller angle. The same size, correct? Then, when it will get minimal angular distance? On the equator, you see? Then the size will be minimal. After that, you start to move it further, and it will start again increase its size. And when you come to the south pole, it will overshine the whole sky. You see, so you could ask, of course, the question why one galaxy not overshines the whole sky. Well, because actually luminosity will be very small, as you understand. You see, this is a simple example which allows you to understand what does it mean curvature. But here, curvature of space-time. And now this guy is making observation, and what he sees, he sees directly this layer, in the middle of this layer where the photon decouple, 
corresponds to the redshift 1050 because the first photons which propagate to us without scattering appear already at the moment of time when the universe was 1,200 times smaller, you see? And the last photons, okay, at redshift 900, something like this one. So the whole interesting things happens within these 90,000 years. Now, this guy, of course, sees what is called standard ruler. It's speed of light multiplied by the time of recombination. Or better to say speed of sound, if I want to be more correct, multiplied by the time of recombination. And then it observes it at this angle. You see 0.87 degrees multiplied by square root of omega total. This is, by the way, not exact answer, but this answer is illustrative because it's in dust-dominated universe, for instance, without cosmological constant, precise formula. Therefore, you look at this thing and your prediction that you have to see this kind of standard ruler precisely at the angle 0 0.87 degrees, which correspond to the multiple L, which is P divided by theta, yeah, at the multiple 200. If you would see it as 300, you measure geometry, but it should be uh, Lobachevsky geometry. If you have seen it at the angle smaller than this angle, then the geometry which you measured for the universe should be the geometry of three sphere, you see? And only in this case, when you measured it precisely to be this quantity, you know that your predictions is verified about omega equal one, yeah. Now, when did I begin? Already one hour. Break. So people wake up, or what we will do? Everybody will get the glass of wine. No, me, me, me needs, okay, but you don't, perhaps, because otherwise you will fall asleep even deeper. Only five minutes. Now, what I see also, I see all this perturbation, homogeneity in the energy density. They can exceed the horizon scale. And then you know that horizon scale is a scale of causality. Therefore, on the scale larger than one, angular scale larger than one degree, you could see embryons precisely in the same shape, like they were produced at the moment of time, 10 minus 35 seconds. This is the most virgin, precise information. But unfortunately, there is not so many uh, multiples which are large and small enough, yeah, L small. There is cosmic variance, therefore here you do not see precision. But those scales which manage to enter this horizon, they become like sound waves. You see, they become like sound waves. They start to evolve. And they can make with this initial spectrum whatever you want. You see? Of course, in very small scales, some initial and homogeneities disappears because of the viscosity. Okay? And there is some minimal scale where after that, fluctuation of the temperature should go down exponentially fast. Okay, and what is our purpose? Okay, now I skip a bunch of formulas, okay? You don't need to see them. 
Okay, yeah. oh, better see them, then you will see what foundation of physics published sometime by mistakes. <laughs> okay, so doesn't matter, doesn't matter, doesn't matter, okay. It's just calculation, but most interesting thing I will point you out nevertheless, okay, so... You know that, as I told you before, okay, forget about all this thing, correlation function, this is what we will be measuring, by the way. It's two antennas, distance, fixed distance between them, and then fluctuation of the temperature in one direction, cross correlation with fluctuation in the other direction, and then you go cover the whole sky, and then find dependence, what is the typical amplitude of the temperature fluctuations depending on the angle of separation between two antennas. And angle of separation we characterize according to this formula by what is called multipole. And on what this thing depends, again, forget about this thing, okay? Forget it or forget. You see, there's sometimes series are uh, getting the bread not for nothing. Boy. As I told you, in big scales, nothing happened. Frozen perturbation. But in the smaller scales, the things are much more complicated because in the smaller scales, for this inhomogeneity, short wave inhomogeneities, you know, everything, I mean, all fluctuation of the temperature are determined by these sound waves which started to oscillate because their frequencies became smaller than cosmological time. Now, one of the most important things, I think, which people just in general reality do not understand and do not appreciate, yeah, is the following thing. This formula, forget. But, you see, this term... For the given initial gravitational potential, define you the amplitude of the generated sound wave. And if perturbation of this sound wave entered horizon when radiation was still dominated, or entered this causally connected region when radiation became negligible, how do you think this amplitude will change depending when there was present radiation, sound waves started to oscillate for the given initial condition, or when radiation became unimportant and sound wave, okay, amplitude acquired when radiation could be negligible. How big can be difference in the amplitude? How do you think? This is most non-trivial thing, actually, where you see all beauty of general relativity. This coefficient for the same initial condition changes by factor 5. Why by factor 5? If perturbation or scale entered horizon started to oscillate when Radiation was important. Don't forget that radiation also contributes to the gravity. And therefore, this radiation, via contribution to the gravity, boosts more amplitude of sound wave. And when perturbation entered horizon, already when radiation is negligible, there is no pressure which contributes to the gravity, right? Therefore, it's not boosted so much. And this coefficient is factor 5 here. And moreover, this change by factor 5 happens when the scales are changing by order of magnitude. And all three first Doppler peaks, which you will see, which appears because of this oscillation, 
precisely correspond to this region in between. This is the reason why I could not sleep nights because I could not find why this bloody second Doppler peak disappears when the amount of baryon just half percent instead of four percent? I called Weinberg. He told me, oh, in my case, it also disappears. But then I found this effect of general relativity which is extremely important because all dependence on cold dark matter appears because of this effect. Two years later, I meet Steve Weinberg in Toronto he started to tell me, Slava, you know that there is coefficient 5z, I recently discovered, I thought, come on, Steve, okay? It's already in my paper, which was published in Foundations of Physics two years ago, but Steve Weinberg was not reading Foundation of Physics, doesn't matter. And you know, it's good to know that there is other guy on the earth who knows about this five coefficient, but this five coefficient is just very tricky effect of general relativity. You see, therefore, when people speak about MOND or alternatives to general relativity, etc., etc., et they first to have to go to the mental hospital and talk with the appropriate doctor. What can I say? I don't know, specify these people, but you know them very well, okay? How after that you can even adapt, okay? The universe is expanding or not expanding. <laughs> Nonsense, yeah. Now, what we will do, now we will make break which you want so much, and me, not less, be sure. <laughs> okay, so 10 minutes break. And then, okay, I will be not, uh, I understand that there are formulas, after that there will be more stories, of course, but nevertheless, I'm not going to torture you for several hours, because I know that to speak several hours is much more easy, if, of course, you are not Brezhnev, yeah, than to listen. Okay, good. Are there any questions until now? a lot of formula, but you skip them and give a nice explanation of this uh, inflation uh, period of universe. But uh, in, a, in a cosmological uh, stories, or, uh, it's also said that in the first uh, seconds of, uh, of first three minutes or first seconds of uh, uh, inflation of uh, our universe is uh, uh, was a decaying of the super force, which is uh, where combined all four forces together, and was decaying in the separately. In the How you can illustrate in your calculation this decay of... Very easy, but you understand that it doesn't influence on the final result, but you understand that to decay this initial cosmological so-called constant or dark energy into other particles, there is hundreds of ways to do it using some kind of imitation for this dark energy using, for instance, scalar field. And, but of course, if there is hundreds of ways to do it in a very nice way yeah, or in an ugly way, it means that we do not know what is the real one. You know that when one of the servants of this Russian guy, Gribayedov, who was a diplomat who wrote one very good music piece and who wrote one very good music or play, okay, called Disaster from Sinkin, or what's a Gori Atuma, when his servant told him, okay, you have so many talent, you know what, how he, rep how he replied? He said that when somebody has too many talent, it means that he has no real one. If you have too many explanations for the same thing, it means that you do not know the real one. But normally, it's not a big problem, you see? Because to make this reheating, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, you can do it very easily, but we do not know what for sure was the mechanism. Unfortunately, it doesn't lead to too much uncertainty in the predictions. Yeah, because we do not know, for instance, this factor of recalculating between galaxies and uh, CMB, 
is 50 or 55. Everything is decoded within this 50 or 55. You see? So, of course, it's disappointing that we do not know everything, yeah? But I think we have to be happy that we know at least something. You know how Einstein was saying the most incomprehensible thing about this world? That it's at least partially con comprehensible, you see? You shouldn't expect too much. But Slava, the universe doesn't care how much we know. But I care how much I know about the universe. The universe, of course, doesn't care about me. Of course, the universe cared about Mr. Bohr, because according to Mr. Bohr, physics was not playing any role in the absence of observers. The Einstein was saying that it's madness. Okay, this is why I cannot accept your quantum mechanics, yeah? Not because you are playing with infinitely large matrices, but this was the real uh, reason for Einstein, why he was fighting all this, with this kind of things.